welcome to Rivers in the Desert, a revival ministry dedicated to bringing the living waters of God's love to a hurting and dying world. It is our desire as you listen to the following message that the Holy Spirit will fill you afresh and that you would be ignited into a fervency for Jesus. This is the day to be filled with the knowledge of His glory as the waters cover the sea. God is doing something new on planet Earth today, and you and I have the great privilege to be a part of it. We love you. Be blessed. have such an expectancy. When I talk to Pastor John, we're such an expectancy in both of us. Um, we're going somewhere we've not been before. And uh, I've never had so many emails come out the last two weeks as, that have come out just one after another. So, but it's kind of hard, not in the natural, but <clears throat> in the spirit because um, they're so heavy and they're so deep that um, whew, it's hard to explain it to you. Hallelujah. But I want to share a prophetic word that a, a young man gave me in Delaware and kind of set you guys. I think a lot of us were going through the same thing last week. Uh, people were complaining of feeling an oppression or confusion in their head, whatever. And I've learned through spiritual warfare, whenever you feel confusion or your mind is, you know, whatever, that's, uh, that's usually uh, witchcraft and you just have to plow through it. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. And, uh, but I was in Delaware, it was a Saturday night meeting, and um, the church has a lot of, um, you know, Delaware was right down the beach there, and uh, Rehoboth Beach, and there was a lot of ex-surfers, or still surfers, whatever, that are in the church, and they're on fire for God, you know, and, uh, you know, just a bunch of ex-hippies getting born again, so to speak, <laughs> and, um, so this one young man got saved about two months ago, and his wife just says, forget about it, I'm leaving you. And so she left their little daughter and him to go back into the world. She never, went even, she never got saved, so she just go back into the world. And he decided, I'm going to go after Jesus. You know, so, and he's brand new in the Lord, okay? He's brand new. And uh, so I'm sitting there, and uh, he walks up to me and says, can I say something to you? right at the end of Saturday night service. I said, what is it? He goes, I'm, I've never done this before, but I have a word for you. I, he actually didn't say it. He said, I have a, a, a letter or a message from God for you. <laughs> and I says, he goes, I've never done this before. I said, well, go ahead. And he was really nervous. And then finally he just closed his eyes and let it loose, you know. And I looked at him and I says, you have no idea how accurate that is right now. He goes, really? Really? God used me? Yeah. And I'll read you part of the word, okay? He said, God said, keep a clear mind. Keep Jesus first. He said, something very big is planned that you've never imagined is about to happen. You're doing a good job, but keep a clear mind. And there's more I won't... Are you there, folks? Amen. And so, you know, like Francis Frangipan's book says, you know, one of the battlegrounds is our mind. We can't keep the birds from flying over our head, but we can keep the birds from nesting in our hair. <laughs> we can't keep the thoughts from coming, but we sure can take that, cast those thoughts down. Amen? Amen? And I want to encourage you, if you have a chance, to get a hold of this book um, called The Heavenly Man. Just go to Yahoo or something or go to Barnes and Nobles or just go to Google. Type in the heavenly man, the remarkable true story of the Chinese Christian brother, Yun. And uh, brothers and sisters, 
I don't advertise books very much. I have a whole basement full of books I don't read anymore, okay? And uh, I've read a lot of books. And uh, nothing has touched me as much outside the Bible as this book right now. It's messed me up. And I may just start reading the whole thing here. <laughs> Hallelujah. An inspirational and heroic story of a radical Christian in the house churches of China. This book is like reading a modern day version of the book of Acts. Prepare to be deeply encouraged as well as rudely awakened. An absolute must for the sleeping churches of the West. Let's see if I have something here to read for you real quick. He went on a 74-day fast. His ears shriveled up to the size of a, of a, a raisin. Supernaturally, in the 74 days, after not speaking a word, he stood up and began to preach the glory of God. Hit the prison. Many prisoners were born again, even prison guards. It, it spread throughout the entire province. But a man that you know, had not eaten or drunk for 74 days suddenly stood up and began to preach on the power of a man that just had a good steak dinner. It was incredible. He says, every day I had a new job in prison that was teaching all the new believers. Righteousness and truth flourished and men grew daily in grace and knowledge. Some of the most horrible prisoners testified of the Holy Spirit conviction, repenting of their sins, and their evil deeds flashing before them as if on a movie screen. One morning, the director of the prison called me to his office. He courteously offered me a cup of tea and sat me down on a soft chair. He said, Yun, you believe in Jesus. Today I have to give you a special assignment. I thought he was going to ask me to report on one of the prisoners. But the director continued, in cell number nine is a murderer named Hung. Every day he tries to kill himself. He is crazy and tries to bite the other prisoners. We've decided them to send him to your cell. They did this all the time to him. From now until the day he's executed, I want you to watch over him. If he kills himself, you're held accountable. When I heard this news, I immediately felt hung was a precious soul the Lord had given us to rescue. <laughs> yeah. See the mentality? Yes. I broke the news to my other cellmates, and everyone was terrified. They didn't want to receive him. One said, he's not a man, he's a devil. And everyone had voiced their protest. I waited for a moment and calmly said, brothers, we believe in Jesus. Before we believed in Jesus, we were just like him. We too were like demons. Jesus rescued our soul when we were about to die. We need to have mercy on this man and treat him as if Jesus treated him himself. My cellmates realized my words were true and everyone changed their attitude. They waited for Hung to arrive like a people waiting for a lost long friend. When Hung was brought into our cell the next morning, I thought he was like the man possessed by a legion of demons in the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. He was handcuffed behind his back and had chains um, around his ankles. He spoke the filthy words and kept trying to mutilate his body by cutting himself with these ankle chains. He was ferocious and full of hatred and was just 22 years old. Hong couldn't use his arms and legs because he was in shackles. But if another prisoner would get too close to him, he would try to bite off his ear or bite his nose off. Even though he was tightly bound, Hong would jump up and down until the white ankle bones were visible through his skin. In cell number nine, the prisoners treated him like an animal, kicking and punching him. They refused to feed him for days. Instead, they mocked him by deliberately pouring his food all over him. His clothes was covered with food stains. One day, out of sheer desperation and pain, Hung waited until nobody was watching, then rammed his head full speed into a wall as hard as he could, trying to kill himself. He survived, but left a dent in the wall. The moment Hung entered our cell, he knew something was different. All of us showed him love and sympathy. Sympathy. We welcomed him with open arms, placing his possessions in a neat order next to his bed. For many days, he had not washed because of his chains and he smelled terribly. 
Because of the love of God in our hearts, we loved Hung. Cellmates pointed to me, pointed to me and told him, this is Yun. He is our leader, a Christian pastor. I told him, Brother Hung, we've all been criminals. Do not fear. We'll take care of you. I encouraged him to sit down and be calm. <laughs> Help me, Lord. I ask everyone to give Hung some of their precious drinking water. We filled a basin and carried it to Hung's side. I tore off a piece of my tattered shirt that he's been wearing in prison for 10 years and dipped it in water. I then gently cleaned the dirt and dried blood from his face and mouth. After drying his face, I tore off a part of my blanket and cleaned the cuts formed by his handcuffs and foot chains. I used a little toothpaste to disinfect his raw wounds and carefully bandaged him. Hung didn't say a word. He just sat there with his eyes wide open and stared at everybody. I knew the Lord was touching his heart already. At lunchtime, each gave some of our rice to our new cellmate. We all said the Lord's Prayer and began to eat. I used a spoon to feed Hung, who was handcuffed. After lunch, we all safely sang a song. We couldn't sing out loud because the guards would come in and beat us. They would stick our heads through a hole in the prison cell, and then they would use their rifle butts to hit us in the face if we made any noises about Jesus. So we sang a song on Matthew 20, chapter 6, verse 25. Our Heavenly Father is great in mercy. He feeds and clothes us every day. We will worship and humbly learn from Him. For our Lord clothes the grass of the field. Do not worry. These are all spontaneous songs that have never been written before in communist China. They came out and now they sing them throughout all these home churches throughout China. Do not worry what we shall eat today or what we shall drink tomorrow. Surely our Father will sustain us. Look at the little sparrow flying to and fro. Look at the lilies of the field. Do not labor or spin. If your Lord dresses, our Lord dresses them in splendor, how much more valuable are we than these? Brother, change your heart. Follow Christ, for this world is not your home. Dinner that evening happened to be the time for our weekly mantau. All the brothers looked at me. I knew they were so hungry. The mantau, once a week, they would get a special piece of bread. To them, it was like their caviar. Once a week, they would get a little special piece, piece of bread. They've already shared our, then I told them, today we've already shared our rice and water with our new friend, Hong, so we can eat our manta tonight, but I hope you'll share some of your soup with him tomorrow. I fed Hong first because he was handcuffed and then started to eat my own meal. When I took the first bite of mantau, I felt like crying. A tender voice welled up inside me saying, I died for you on the cross. How can you show me that you love me when I'm hungry, when I'm in prison, when I'm thirsty? If you do these things, the least of my brethren, you've done it for me. Immediately I knew God wanted me to sacrifice what was left of my mantel bread. I gave it to Hung. I bowed down and wept. I said, Lord, I'm starving. I feel so hungry. A scripture came from the Bible to my mind, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall nakedness, famine, dangerous sword. I wrapped the rest of my mantel in a handkerchief and placed it inside my clothes, save it for hung. Immediately peace and joy returned to me. If you don't have peace and joy, it's because we're living for self. The next morning's breakfast consisted of a watery noodle soup containing just a few strands of noodles. We all shared our soup with Hung. But he wasn't happy even with his larger portion, so he shouted to the guard, I'm going to die. Why don't you give me a good-sized meal? Are you trying to starve me before you execute me? Right then the Lord told me, Hurry, take the mantel from your shirt and feed him. With my back turned toward <clears throat> Hantau, I broke the bread and placed a piece of mantel in his soup bowl. Immediately Hung's stony heart broke on the spot. He dropped off his chair, knelt on the floor, and wept. He said, older brother, why do you love me like this? Why didn't you eat your special bread last night? I'm a murderer. I hated by all men. Even my parents, my brothers and sisters, and my fiancé have disowned me. Why do you love me so much? I cannot repay your kindness now, but after I die, I'll become a ghost, and I'll come back to your cell and serve you the good deeds you've done. I knew this was the time. 
The Lord wanted me to share the gospel with him. I told Hung, it's because Jesus loves you that we're treating you nicely. If we didn't believe in him, we would have treated you the same way as all the other men in this prison. You should thank God for his son, Jesus Christ. And immediately Hung, Hung said, Lord, I love you. I thank you for loving a sinner like me. This hardened criminal tearfully accepted the love of Jesus into his heart. He was released from his burden of sin. All the other prisoners were so happy. They realized that only the love of God can give true hope to those bound by sin. After Hung received God's salvation, the atmosphere in the cell greatly improved. Everyone began to sing together. Hung was so eager to learn all he could. I taught him about Jesus, his life, his teaching, sufferings, resurrection, second coming. I warned Hung, suicide is sin. When he heard this, he fell down and wept, confessing his sin. He asked me to lift up the shirt collar. Because inside the shirt collar was a small razor blade he intended to use to kill himself when he was unshackled. Completely broken, Hung shared his story with me. His father was the wealthy manager of a large company and Communist Party leader. After high school, Hung assigned to a job as a technician in a power plant. When he was 20 years old, was engaged to be married. His fiancée loved him, but he was drawn into a local gang. He was quickly led astray. He, every day he drank heavily. They looted stores, murdered innocent people, and raped women. One of the gang members was arrested and interrogated. They told the, the, um, the communists that Hung was involved. They arrested him. Hung's life was aimless. He was released from prison. He went back into drinking. They were so hopeless. So Hung and his friend made a suicide pact. They decided to steal two bags of dynamite from their father's corporation in each bag from the storehouse of the power plant where Hung used to work. They decided to go in an empty room and fight one another until the death. And then the survivor would carry the dead man's body to the power transfer and they would de detonate the explosives. The two comrades would die together. The two started to fight using metal swords. Hung's shoulder was hurt, but struck the other man's head, killing him instantly. His friend's skull split open and his brain spilled out. When he saw this, Hung was terrified and ran away. Hung knew that the authorities would hunt him, so he decided to travel all over China and enjoy the pleasures of a sinful life. And then when he finished, he planned to return home to see his family one last time before killing himself. Hung purchased a sharp knife and robbed shops to finance his journey. He traveled around and raped many young innocent girls. He... After his trial, I mean, long story short, they finally caught up with him. The time was when he was in prison, there was no way for any hope for him. His father could not help him. The final straw that broke his back, this is where the entrance of demons came in, was when his father sent a shirt to the prison for him. And on the back of the shirt was written, I'm unable to see you now, but I will see you at the execution. Now that Hung had fully repented and became a new creature, he loved to sing a and sing all he could. <laughs> because of the change of his heart, we named him Hong Ungang, which is grace and light. Even though he knew he would die soon, Hung asked many questions about how he would, could live out his remaining days to bring the most glory to Jesus. Usually if we made too much noise, the guards would punish us cruelly. They would stick our heads through a small hole in the bottom of the cell door, just large enough for a man to put his head through. The guards would kick us or use their rifle butts to beat our heads. Therefore, we always worshiped and prayed very quietly, ensuring there were no guards outside our door. However, Hung worshiped Jesus so loudly that often the guards came in and told him to be quiet. But because of his impending execution, they didn't punish him. Because Brother Hung had nothing to lose, he sang at the top of his voice all the time. <laughs> Cell number two became a praise and worship center. Many of the other prisoners in other cells were touched by the words they heard. Hung asked me to carve a cross into the wall of our cell. The cement was very hard, but we all worked together to bless our brother. Hung told us if the guards noticed the cross, he would take full responsibility. Whenever we were allowed to go into the yard outside, we searched for broken glass or old nails that we could use to scratch marks on the wall. I etched a large cross in the wall. We drew a picture of the world and wrote the words, For God so loved the world. Hung also asked us to etch out a picture of a grave below the cross with gravestones displaying his new name to show that he belonged to Jesus. <laughs> when we had finished, <laughs> Hung wept and shouted for joy. 
We continued our drawings until all four walls of the cell were covered with numerous Bible verses. <laughs> Strangely, even though the guards saw our work of art, they never said a word about it. The cross and Bible verses remain in that cell to this day. Hundreds of prisoners have read these words and many have repented and placed their trust in Jesus since then. Using tiny pins from our prison badges as needles, we would carefully pull threads from our towels one at a time. Each man embroidered a small cross on the upper left side of his prison uniform. A red cross was made for hung shirt. The new believers were so inspired. <laughs> they gained much strength and encouragement now that they bore the cross on their chest. On the evening of August 16th, 1983, we baptized Brother Hung. Each prisoner received a daily ration of just one cup of water from the kitchen. But each man sacrificially gave half of his daily ration so we could have enough water to pour over his head in baptism. This is the best baptism we could do under the circumstances. After his baptism, he asked, can Jesus save my family? I told him the Bible verse, believe in the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved, you and your household. Hung prayed throughout the night for his entire family to know God's salvation. Hung's execution date was fast approaching. He desperately wanted to write a letter to his family. This was impossible because his hands were so tightly handcuffed behind his back. After his conversion, Hung had become gentle, and the whole prison noticed the difference. I pleaded with the authorities, assuring them that Hung was no longer a threat. The guards gave him a larger, looser handcuff, but they refused to remove the cuffs altogether. With these new hand loose handcuffs, Hung asked the guards to bring him a pen and two sheets of paper. He sat on the floor with a paper placed beside him. By moving his hands to the side, he was able to write. But after a few words, his pen ran out of ink. In desperation, he leaned down and bit the forefinger of his right hand. It started to flow with blood. Hung continued to write a letter to his parents using his own blood as ink. He wrote, Dear Papa, Mama, I cannot see you anymore, but I know you love me. Your son has dishonored you. Please don't feel sad after I die. I want to tell you some tremendous news. I will not die, for I have received eternal life. <laughs> I met a merciful man. <laughs> You've got to get this book, folks. <laughs> I met a brother, Jean. He rescued my life and helped me believe in Jesus. He loved me, cared for me, and fed me every day. Papa and Mama, I'm on my way to the kingdom of God. I'll pray for you all. You must believe in Jesus. Please allow Brother Young to share the gospel with you. When he visits you, he'll tell you the rest of my story. Receive eternal life. See you in the kingdom of God, your son, Hung. I arranged for Hung's letter to be smuggled out of prison and delivered to his parents. Hung was baptized on August 16th, the wrote the letter to his parents on the 17th, and was executed on the 18th. On the last day, of Hung's life. The atmosphere in prison was very tense. A double guard was placed on duty. Every five minutes, the guard checked out the prisoners, shining a light into our cell to make sure everything was under control. We all knew this only occurred when a prisoner was about to be executed. On the evening of the 17th, the Lord led me to wash Hung's feet. Hung was very calm and smiled at the prisoners. He told them we shall all meet again in the kingdom of heaven. The next morning we had breakfast. The cards came. They took Hung to the execution yard. They also took me for my trial the same day. He threw himself into my arms. He cried, I'll see you in heaven. In the yard, a guard kicked Hung's legs out from under him so, he, so that he was kneeling on the ground. He released the leg chains and handcuffs. They placed a hat on his head that said, condemned criminal. That was the last I saw of dear precious brother Hung in his life. They took him to a place where they shot him in the back of the head. I heard the shot that sent Hung into the arms of Jesus. I was both sad and full of joy at the same time. I thank God he gave me a chance to see my brother go to the kingdom of heaven. 
Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalms 116. Hallelujah. Folks, that's just three pages of one of the most incredible books I've ever read. Hallelujah. Do you want to hear a little more or do you want to go on? This is the first time he was in prison for preaching. I want to read just the first little bit of how he got a Bible as a young man. The Lord called me to follow him at the age of 16. The year was 1974. At that time, my father was very sick. He suffered a, s a severe type of asthma and developed lung cancer. The cancer spread to his stomach. The doctor told him he would die soon. There's no hope for your husband. Go home and prepare for his death. Every night, my dad lay in bed and could hardly breathe. Being a very superstitious man, he asked some neighbors to fetch a local Deus priest to come and cast demons out of him. My dad's sickness sapped all of our money, possessions, and energy. I wasn't able to attend school because of our poverty. I had to drop out at the age of 16 to help my father. One night my mother was lying on her bed, barely awake. Suddenly she heard a very clear, tender, compassionate voice say, Jesus loves you. She knelt down on the floor and tearfully repented of her sins, rededicated her life to the Lord Jesus. Like the prodigal, my mother came home to the Lord. She immediately called our family to come and pray to Jesus. She told us Jesus is the only hope for our Father. All of us committed our lives to God when we heard what happened. When then we laid hands on our Father, and the rest of the night we cried out a simple prayer, Jesus, heal Father, Jesus, heal Father, for the whole night. The next morning, my father found he was much better, and for the first time in months, he ate. Within a week, he had completely covered, recovered, no trace of cancer. <laughs> My parents were so grateful for what he had done. They began to share the good news with everyone in the village. In those days, it was illegal to hold any public gatherings. But my parents began to invite all their friends to the house. All our relatives arrived and they locked the doors, covered the windows, and explained how the father had been healed. All of our relatives and friends knelt down immediately and prayed to receive Jesus. My mother had never learned to read or write, but she became the first preacher of our village. She didn't know much of the Bible, but the Bibles were very rare. I was amazed how God used to use my mother despite her illiteracy and ignorance. The direction of her heart was totally surrendered to Jesus. Some of today's greatest house church leaders in China first met the Lord through my mother's ministry. I asked if, as a young man, is there any words of Jesus left I could read for myself? My mom replied, no, all his words are gone. There's nothing left of his teaching. During the Cultural Revolution in China, there was no Bibles to be found. From that day on, I earnestly wanted to have a copy of my own Bible. I asked my mother and fellow Christians what a Bible looked like, but no one knew. One person had seen some hand copied portions of scriptures or some song sheets, but no one had a whole Bible. Only a few old believers could recall seeing Bibles many years before. The word of God was scarce in the land. I was so hungry for a Bible, seeing my desperation, my mother remembered an old man who lived in another village. This man had been a pastor before the, the Cultural Revolution. Together we started out on a long walk to his home. When we found him, we told him our desire. We longed to see a Bible. Do you have one? He immediately looked fearful. This man had already spent 20 years in prison for his faith. He looked at me and saw I was a young, poor man with tattered clothes and bare feet. He felt compassion, but still didn't want to show me his Bible. I don't blame him. There are very few Bibles in the whole of China. Nobody was allowed to read any other book than Mao's little red book. The old pastor simply told me the Bible is a heavenly book. If you want one, you need to pray to the God of heaven. He'll give you one. He always answers those who seek him with all their heart. I fully trusted the pastor's words. When I returned home, I brought a stone into my room and I knelt down on it every evening for prayer. I had just one simple prayer, Lord, please give me a Bible, amen. I didn't know how to pray, but I continued that prayer for one month. Nothing happened, a Bible didn't appear. I went back to the pastor's house again, this time I went alone, I told him, I prayed to God, but I haven't received a Bible. 
Please show me your Bible. Just one glance and I'll be satisfied. I don't need to touch it. Just you hold it. But be, I just want to look at it. Maybe I can copy down some words and return home happy. The pastor saw the anxiety in my heart. He spoke to me again. If you're serious, then you should not only kneel down and pray to the Lord. You should fast and weep. The more you weep, the sooner you'll get a Bible. I went home every morning and afternoon. I ate and drank nothing. Every evening I ate just one bowl, small bowl of steamed rice. I cried like a hungry child to his heavenly father wanting to be filled with his word. For the next 100 days I prayed for a Bible until I could bear it no more. My parents thought I was losing my mind. Looking back years later, I would say this whole experience was the most difficult thing I ever endured. Suddenly, one morning at 4 a.m., after months of begging God for a Bible, I received a vision from the Lord while kneeling beside my bed. In the vision, I was walking up a steep hill trying to push a heavy cart in front of me. I was heading towards a village where I intended to beg for food for my family. I was struggling greatly because in my vision I was hungry and weakened by constant fasting. The old cart was about to roll back and fall on me. I then saw three men walking down the hill in the opposite direction. A kind old man who had a very long beard was pulling a large cart full of fresh bread. Two other men were walking on each side of the cart. When the old man saw me, he felt great pity. Are you hungry? I replied. Yes, I had nothing to eat. I'm on my way home to get some food for my family. I wept because my family was so extremely poor. Because of my father's sickness, we sold everything valuable to buy medicine. We had little to eat, and for years we've been forced to beg for food from friends and neighbors. When the old man asked me if I was hungry, I couldn't help but cry. I never felt such genuine love and compassion from anyone before. In the vision, the old man took a red bag of bread from his trolley and asked his two friends to give it to me. He said, you must eat it immediately. I opened the wrapping and saw there was a burn, a bun of fresh bread inside. When I put the bun in my mouth, it instantly turned into the Bible. Immediately in my vision, I knelt down with my Bible and cried out to the Lord in thanksgiving. Lord, your name is worthy to be praised. You that despise my prayer. You allow me to receive this Bible. I'm going to serve you the rest of my life. I woke up and started searching the house for the Bible. The rest of my family was asleep. The vision was so real, I realized it was only a dream, but I was deeply anguished and I wept loudly. My parents rushed to my room to see what had happened. They thought I'd gone crazy from all my fasting and praying. I told them about the vision, but the more I shared, the crazier they thought I was. Mother said, the day hasn't dawned yet, and no one has come to our house. The door's firmly locked. My father held me tightly with tears in his eyes. He cried, dear Lord, have mercy on my son. Don't let him lose his mind. I'm willing to be sick again if it, take, it, prevents my, if it will prevent my son from losing his mind. Please give my son a Bible. My mother and father and I knelt down and wept together, arm in arm. Suddenly I heard a faint knock on the door. A very gentle voice called my name. I rushed over and asked at the locked door, are you bringing the bread to me? The gentle voice replied, yes. We have a, a bread feast to give you. I immediately recognized the voice as the same one I had seen in the vision earlier. I opened the door and there standing before me was the same two servants I had seen in the vision. One man held a red bag in his hand. My heart raced as I opened the bag and held in my hands my very own Bible. The two men quickly departed in the still darkness. I clutched my new Bible to my heart. I fell down on my knees outside the door. I thank God again and again. I promised Jesus that from that moment on I would devour his work, a hungry child. Mm. Folks, that's just the first. Whew. Hallelujah. Let's go to the book of Amos tonight. For those who like to order the book, The Heavenly Man, Monarch Books, you can buy, I'm sure you can look at it later and get the ISBN number if you need it. I can't put it down, folks. But it's not like I can read it fast. I read it and I, I, I'm, I'm too messed up. I, mean, I read it last night and I fell asleep with it in my hand and all of a sudden I remember Dully taking it out of my hand and putting it on the table next to me. And I was like, I felt like somebody just took my heart out. Where's the book? Hallelujah. In the book of Amos tonight, I feel we should just quickly look at some things. 
And may we return back to a love for his word. Hallelujah. There's a, um, a former drug addict who is now a pastor in Canada. You'll meet him next week. Um, he doesn't have a whole lot of <laughs> training or whatever, but he's a man of the spirit. When I was at his church a few months ago, he said, I feel led to give you this. And what he gave me was a plumb line. What this is is a, a building plumb line. And we're going to study about it tonight. Hallelujah. Because the plumb line is falling. In Amos chapter 1, the words of Amos which he saw, who was among the sheep herders from Tekoa, which he envisioned in the visions concerning Israel in the days of Uzziah, the days of Jeroboam, two years before the earthquake. Now this is, he's a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. And this idea of this earthquake is known throughout Middle Eastern literature, ancient Near Eastern literature because one of the largest, most volatile earthquake zones in the world is along the Dead Sea and Jordan River. It runs from Russia, Moscow, all the way down to Kenya, from the largest tectonic plates that shift in the earth. And that's why the Dead Sea is, goes the lowest point on earth because there's so many earthquakes there. And uh, we have a friend, Mikhail, who lives in Ma'ale Adamim, which is just, just you know, a stone's throw, so to speak from uh, the River Jordan <clears throat> and the Dead Sea. And there was a, a small earthquake two years ago in Israel. And he said, and it was 60 miles underground, the epicenter just a few miles away, but 60 miles underground. He was walking outside and he said he, he heard the sound. Before he ever felt the ground move, he heard a sound. It sounded like billions of pieces of glass breaking. <laughs> And then the earth just, everything just started rolling. Everything started rolling. And that was just a minor tremor. <clears throat> now, I don't know what the Lord has planned, but I'll be in San Jose on Thursday in two weeks. And they have mentioned that that same San Francisco earthquake fault line is ready to unload again. It just came out in the news recently. It's locked and loaded and ready to go. I don't know if something's gonna happen, Yeah, I was, yeah. <clears throat> so when I got up this morning, I began to study about earthquakes. And when I was in Aunt Ottawa last month, uh, the Lord told me to prophesy, and the next day an earthquake hit. And then, you know, it's a long story. But I'm reading about this, that this is two years before the earthquake. Now, this earthquake was so big that other cultures that lived around that area even wrote about it. You understand, folks, most stuff is passed on through oral law. When something written down is very important. And for people to write this down and to date everything to the time, like, you know, here we say, well, remember when the Olympics was here? You know, you remember this, okay? And then we use that as a watershed. When they use an earthquake as a watershed, you know it was a big earthquake. And notice, folks, that same fault line is going to split the Mount of Olives wide open. <laughs> and the Dead Sea is going to become fresh. Hallelujah. But it says here in verse 2, he said, The Lord roars from Zion. From Jerusalem he utters his voice. The shepherd's pastor's ground mourns. The summit of Carmel dries up. And then God begins to bring forth a judgment on the neighbors of Israel. But in chapter 2, he now turns the judgment towards Judah and Israel. Chapter 3, verse 1, he now declares not just the Gentile nations are guilty, but even his own people are guilty. Chapter 3, verse 1. Hear this word which the Lord has spoken against you, sons of Israel, against the entire family which he brought up from the land of Israel. You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I'll punish you for all your iniquities. Do two men walk together unless they have an, an appointment? Does a lion roar in the forest when he has no prey? Does a young lion growl from his den unless he has captured something? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground when there's no bait in it? Does a trap spring up in the earth when there's nothing captures nothing at all. If a shofar is blown in a city, will not the people tremble? 
If calamity occurs in a city, has not the Lord done it? Surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Now I want you to underline this word here, secret counsel. If you're able to remember it, it's the Hebrew word sod, S-O-D. It means intimate, private counsel, okay? It is clandestine information that is not privy to anybody else. This is the same Hebrew word where we get the intelligence agency called Mossad, British intelligence, CIA, KGB, Mossad, okay? It's from this root. Okay, there's information Mossad knows about that we will never know about, okay? It's classified. So forget about all that Tom Clancy novel stuff and all that other spy, spy stuff. I want to hang out with God. Hallelujah. Because the Lord God does nothing unless he first reveals his secret counsel to his servants, the prophets. Now, what's interesting about this is that, that this same Hebrew word is used in Job for the friendship of God. Job lamented, oh, the days that the friendship of God was over my tent. Hallelujah. It's the same Hebrew word, sowed. It's also used in Proverbs 3, that the Lord is intimate, or his secret counsel is with the upright. And when I read this, okay, not just his prophets, but if you want to become a friend of God, you are open to privy information. God will give you a pieces of the, uh, um, uh, the puzzle. He'll allow you to see through a glass dimly. Here and there, you'll see certain things of what he's about to do on earth so this day won't overtake us. Amen? Amen? And all you have to do is start reading and getting in close with him, and he'll start downloading things. And what we want to do is we want to help activate that in you, uh, in this environment. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Praise the Lord. And what's going to activate this inside of you is to have a services a congregation, a fellowship based on the, the, the early church pattern. Anything that's three cent, third century and to now is all, I think, rubbish, to tell you the truth. Amen. That's why the church has gone to the dark ages. We got away from the biblical pattern. And so, anyway, we won't go into all that tonight anyway, but the plumb line is swinging. <laughs> In verse 7, it says, Sure, the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret counsel to his servants and prophets. The lion is roared, who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? What you're going to start moving into, brothers and sisters, is not just the oracle ability of a tongues and interpretation to give somebody a word. You're going to start moving into a place where you cannot help but talk. The power of God is going to start coming upon us, okay? And the, and, the, and, and the word of the Lord is going to come out of us in such a way that you're not going to be able to hold it back. The depth and the breadth of this is something the church has never seen before. In chapter 4, the prophet Amos, verse 11, begins to go after the people, namely the leadership. I overthrew you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 11 of chapter 4. You were like a firebrand snatched from a blaze, yet you have not returned to me, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus I will do to you, O Israel, because I shall do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms the mountains and creates the wind, and declares to man what are his thoughts, who makes dawn into darkness and treads on the high place of the earth, the Lord of the armies of heaven is his name. Folks, we are moving into the ruthlessness and the warriorness, hallelujah, if I use that word, of the Lord of the armies of heaven. Hallelujah. Woo! Oh. Hear this word I take up for you as a dirge, O house of Israel. She has fallen, shall not rise again. Verse 4 of chapter 5, thus says the Lord God to the house of Israel, seek me that you may live. Do not resort to Bethel. Bethel was where Jeroboam, the rebel king, had moved away and set up at Bethel. The audacity of him to set up a new worship center at Bethel, which was the place of the open heaven that Jacob encountered. Bethel, the house of God. Do not cross the Gilgal. Do not cross over to Beersheba, for Gilgal will circle in captivity. Bethel will come in trouble. Seek the Lord that you may live, lest he break forth like fire, O house 
of Joseph. Remember, Tanya had a word here two weeks ago. You've seen my fire come in this place, but what's coming next is an inferno. Now, when you begin to let the Lord issue forth from you, okay, you're going to be persecuted. This book, I've always been encouraged. I don't mind persecution. I don't mind ridicule, contempt, okay, backbiting. I don't mind, you know, Judas. I've been through it a lot. Okay, it doesn't matter to me, okay? But when I began to read this, I began to understand that we began to roar forth the utter truth of God's word and his justice system. We are going to be hunted down and persecuted and killed and thrown in prison, etc. That's right. And look at verse 10. They hate him who reproves in the gate. They abhor him who speaks with integrity. I didn't, want, I didn't want this ministry. Jeremiah didn't want this ministry. He complained about it. But there'll come a place where the message that you bring is so hard and difficult for some people because they're not truly lovers of the truth. We cannot fall back into self-preservation. Right. Verse 15, hate evil and love good. Establish justice in the gate. Perhaps the, the Lord, the God of the armies of heaven, may be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. Verse 21, he says, I hate, I reject your festivals. Nor do I like in your delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you call upon me to burn offerings, your grain offerings, I'll not accept them. I'll not even look at the peace offerings of your fatlings. Take away from the noise of your songs. I'll not even listen to the sound of your harps. But let justice roll down like waters and righteous like an ever-flowing stream. The word justice here is mishpat. It's the same word for judges, shoptim. We're not talking about just legal, legal justice, okay? We're not talking about being, being a lawyer or a judge, okay, in constitutional law, etc. We are talking about the justice system of God and the ultimate justice system of God, the ultimate warrior system is to be a judge, a show team, a deliverer. Yeah. The Bible says that the people cried out to God because of their oppression and he raised up judges. And this is the pattern of the New Testament church I've been teaching over and over. And I'll tell you what, folks, President Bush says, hallelujah. He always judge, judges his success by how many enemies he's made. Glory to God. And the more I'm preaching this message about judges versus the monarchy, what is the pattern of the New Testament church? The more enemies I'm making. Hallelujah. Glory to God. But I feel God's pleasure in it. Yeah. And this young man drove all the way up here because he just wants to drain this well dry. Hallelujah. He always wants to suck out everything he can about this revelation, folks. Judges, if you've not been here, let me share it quick. God ordained judges. They're not lawgivers, okay? They're not litigators. The word in judge is shoptim. They're military champions or deliverers. What happened in the book of Judges? The people sinned. They cried out because of oppression. And God, he anointed a Deborah or a Gideon or Barak. They raised up and they were not litigators. They went to war. Woo! Hallelujah! Right. And the people rallied to that point. Amen. And Samuel was a judge. David was a judge. But the people rejected the judgeship. They said, we want a king. We want somebody tall and handsome that has an anointing. Okay, that's prophetic, then we'll go to war. It's okay if he'll rule and control us and all these other things. Just, you know, we're tired of this judge pattern. And they did not reject Samuel, they rejected God. That's right. Amen. That's right. And David was a powerful judge, a powerful military deliverer. The word deliverer there is the same word, Yeshua. Amen. Jesus. <laughs> and as soon as David quit being a judge, okay, blessed be the Lord God that trains my hands for battle, my fingers for war. And he became a king. He lost everything. He no longer went to war. He saw Bathsheba, okay, committed adultery, and then had her husband, Uriah, killed, okay? And Uriah in Hebrew means the glory of the Lord. And David, that was it. And even if you read in Hebrews, it says, what more should I say in Hebrews 11, the hall of fame of faith, of Deborah, Gideon, Jephthah, you know, of David and the prophets, the writer of Hebrews skips over 400 years of monarchy. Why? Because God never approved of the monarchy. That's right. God never wanted a temple. God's not rebuilding the temple of David. He's rebuilding the tabernacle of David. Amen. David was called to, to be content with a mobile tabernacle, a tent. Amen. And when the people cried out, God would raise up a man or woman as a judge, as a charismatic deliverer. Hallelujah. And that's the pattern of the fivefold ministry gift. 
In Psalm 68, hallelujah. Let the Lord arise, let his enemies be scattered and splattered. Glory to God. The people cry out, and then God rescues prisoners and showers gifts unto men. Paul quotes that verse in Ephesians 4 to recognize that's the government of the local New Testament church. <laughs> and so if a leader does not have a charismatic anointing to deliver people from demons, okay, is not a soul winner, is not bent for war, then all he is is a professional manager, a professional clergy. And I used to be one of them so I can talk about it. So what we do is we rally to a point, amen? We've got to rally to a place of humbleness and repentance and cry out. Folks, we are so blessed here. Just read this, amen? Glory to God and realize that how... Anyway. And if we can get, read this and understand the depravity of how shallow we are as Christians here, amen? Yeah. And what other people are going through, amen? Yeah. And we change our ideas and we begin to cry out in repentance out of that atmospherics hallelujah god will send holy ghost judges Amen. men and women evangelists Woo. prophets Amen. apostles Amen. pastors and teachers glory Amen. to god hallelujah. for the work of ministry Amen. Woo. Amen. And the whole purpose of a judge is justice. Amen. Amen. And when the church, I was reading this, when they were suffering injustice and they cried out, you think you have a problem somebody speaking against you? Okay, or somebody doing something to you. How about these people? When the guards would defecate on them every day, go in there and urinate on these guys. Just because they're believers in Jesus. And every day they would forgive them and cry out for revival. Lord, forgive this communist government. Glory to God. Hallelujah. That's what spreads the justice of God throughout the land. Amen. And the enemy and the sinful nature of man will target you and I with such a hatred because they hate those that speak with integrity. Hallelujah. But count it all joy. Yeah. For great is reward in heaven. Hallelujah. Verse 24, let justice roll down like waters. Righteous like an ever flowing stream. I mean, his wife, they, they hardly even knew each other. He was in prison so much. And she got pregnant with their son. And the Chinese said, that's it. Your husband's going to die in prison because he's a revolutionary against the, the, you know, against the communist government here. We're going to abort your baby. You're going to be here in two weeks and we're going to abort your baby. Now tie her down. It doesn't matter what she thinks or says, okay? Has no lawyer, no attorney, no justice system there. They tie her down and force the abortion. And so she cried out to God. said, God, you promised me a child. And suddenly the baby was born two months early. Hallelujah. <laughs> and it, she went into labor with no pain. Supernaturally born in a little mud hut. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Did you read about that in the, Egypt, the Egyptians? Come on. Wanting to kill the Hebrew children. They couldn't get there in time because the Hebrew women were giving birth so quick. Oh! Hallelujah. We ain't seen nothing yet! And then verse 25, did you present me with sacrifice and grain offerings in the wilderness these 40 years? We talk about justice. This scripture has been taken out of context. Pardon if I preach tonight. It's okay. This scripture I've heard over and over. Social injustice. The unborn. The widows. The orphans. You know, humanitarian rights. I agree with that. But that's lifted out of context. The first justice that he's crying out for is verse 25. The false hypocritical worship of believers who worship him with their lips, with their hearts far from him. That is the justice he wants back. Amen. Oh, amen. The second justice he wants back, verse 26. You carried along Sicca, your king, and Kiriam, your images, the star gods you made for yourselves. Where do these things come from? This is what they took out of Egypt. 
Therefore, I'll make you go into exile beyond Damascus, says the Lord, whose name is the God of heaven. You know when, do anybody here know when this was quoted in the New Testament? Keep your figure here. Go with me to Acts chapter 7 on the seventh day, hallelujah, of the week. Acts chapter 7. Seven minutes left on the day. Stephen. Stephen has given his counsel before the people. And verse 142, God turned away and delivered them up to the serve the host of heaven as written in the book of the prophets. It's not to me that you offered victims and sacrifices 40 years in the wilderness. Was it, O house of Israel? You also took along with you the tabernacle of Moloch and the star god of Ramphah, the images which you made to worship them. I remove you beyond Babylon. Acts 7, 42 through 44. And guess what they did? Verse 51, you stiff-necked, uncircumcised in heart, and ears always resisting the Holy Spirit. And verse 50, 54, they heard this, they were cut to the quick and began to gnash their teeth at him. And being full of the Holy Ghost, and t gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Notice Jesus was not sitting. He was standing. Woo-hoo! Hallelujah! And he said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand. And they, a loud voice covered their ears and rushed upon him with one impulse. How about that for unity? And began to crush his skull. And they threw their garments to a young guy to hold it, which was Saul. And verse 6, he falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against him. And having said this, he did not die, he fell asleep. And it was that prayer of forgiveness that launched Saul to become Paul. Why did they get so mad? Let's go back to Amos, you'll see why. Amos, verse 5 and verse 26. The second justice God wants in this hour, to flow down like an ever-flowing stream, is not for the hypocrisy removed from his house. Okay, people say, oh yeah, we love you, we love you, love you, but their actions speak so loud I can't hear what they're saying. Amen? Amen. Come on, folks, we got things to change, amen? amen? The second thing God wants, verse 26, is to get rid of all cult, all idols. That's right, amen, amen. Whether it be a pastime, an entertainment, or a figurine. Hallelujah. So many Christians are intent on their entertainment systems. And I won't stop preaching about it. <laughs> Verse 27, and I'll remove you beyond Damascus in exile. And he talks now about justice in the house, those that are at ease in Zion. Chapter 7, go with me quickly, brothers and sisters. You're doing good tonight. Thank you for being patient. Remember, I'm, I'm cueing off the word. I, I trust when God gives somebody a word here. I don't just don't say, oh, that was nice, you know. I really believe when Tanya said this, I felt the witness. God has sent a fire here, amen. He's not going to send an inferno. Amen. And it says in verse 4 of chapter 7, Thus says the Lord God who showed me, and behold, the Lord God was calling to contend with them by fire. And it consumed the great deep and began to consume the farmland. Then I said, oh, Lord God, please stop. <laughs> How can Jacob stand for you so small and the Lord change his mind? Verse 7, then he showed me, behold, the Lord was standing by a vertical wall with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, what do you see, Amos? And I said, a plumb line. The Lord said, behold, I'm about to put a plumb line in the midst of my people and I'll spare them no longer. And so while he's seeing these things, Okay, chapter, 10 kicks, chapter 7, verse 10 kicks in. The name Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, sent word to Jeroboam, that's the reprobate king of Israel, saying, Amos has conspired, uh, conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is unable to endure all his words. Brothers and sisters, when we let loose and go after God of all of our heart and begin to cry out for justice like this. Our words become the oracles of God himself. And this very land itself will not be able to endure the word of the Lord. 
That's what I received in prayer today. And that's why I wrote an email saying this is not a drill. Everybody, dive below the radar, evasive action, lock and load. This is what we've been training for. Something is about to happen. And I know why I need it when I met her. She's a no-nonsense person about this. There is going to be something <laughs> shake and bake this week. Okay? Here in Atlanta, as the procession is done around the Capitol or wherever we can get close to, and the shofar is sounded, and the people prophesy. Come on, folks. Hallelujah. This is not just a St. Patrick's Day, you know, parade. This is something divine from heaven. Amen. And when I talk to the people in charge of this event, and I talk to them, they're, they're like, we're fasting and praying. We're having prayer. Oh, and, and they're just so locked in. All of us are like one voice right now. Something is about to happen. I want to see justice come into Atlanta. Amen. Amen. Woo! Amen. So these prophetic words shook everything, even to the point it shook the Rift Valley. And one of the greatest earthquakes ever in earth history happened two years later. listening to our message today to you. Perhaps you have a friend, perhaps yourself are sitting there and wondering, where would I go if I died today? We'd like to give you a great privilege of praying with us and leading you to a knowledge of Jesus the Messiah. The Bible says, if any man or woman would call upon the name of Jesus, they would be saved. The Greek word for saved is healed, delivered. It's a wonderful promise. You're there now in your automobile, perhaps at home listening. Go ahead and pray this prayer with me. Say, Dear Father, I ask you in the name of Jesus to forgive me of my sins. The Bible says, if anybody would call upon your name, they would be saved. I'm calling today, Lord, save me, forgive me, cleanse me, take all of my sins and cast them into the sea of forgetfulness. Father, I'm coming running home to you now. In your name I pray, amen. God bless you. We love you guys.